Hi, I'm Lena Minifee with Ricochet Media, and we're here with Arthur Manuel, the author of Unsettling Canada. Uh, you co-wrote the book with Grand Chief Ronald Derrickson, and you just finished, I guess, a soft launch here in Vancouver. Yes. Um, you want to explain the title of the book a little bit to uh, our viewers and what it's about? Uh, the Unsettling Canada is because uh, Canada is a, a settled country. It's a settled state government. And so is the United States, so is Australia, so is New Zealand. And which means basically all of federal provincial law involving forestry, involving uh, uh, fisheries or involving minerals or anything to do with the land, all of them are written from the context of providing economic uh, wealth to the settler and they actually feel entitled that they can actually go in like mining companies you know like they don't care about indigenous rights so the logging companies they don't care about indigenous rights they will talk to us they'll they'll negotiate but they'll always try to pull a trick on us and get out there as cheap as they can you know on that and we don't really have any decision making power so we're saying unsettling Canada is to is to uh, challenge that you know unsettling is to unsettle there's two unsettlings in there you know one is unsettling the settler canada is really what, it, what we're getting at and uh because we need to replace it with a uh, recognition and affirmation of existing aboriginal treaty rights and recognizing indigenous uh, uh you know um rights to act to make decisions regarding access and benefits to the land because we have underlying title to it so that's what we're, we're, we're talking about. So that's the, the reason why we call it Unsettling Canada. Can I ask you, why did you decide to write this book? And why, why now? Why, why not before? <laughs> well, I think one of the things is that we're really in a critical situation in relationship to resolving the unresolved Indian land uh, question here, especially in British Columbia. And I think that a lot of the young, especially indigenous people, and everybody really, they don't really have an indigenous perspective of what's happened over the last 50 years. It sort of has culminated in this, this, uh, I guess, this uh, very dynamic and changing time we're in. So I wanted to add uh, that to the, to the picture. So that's what the book is, is a big overview. Um, wh what is your experience and your background and your approach to this book that was different than Chief Ronald's? Well, I think uh, Ron uh, is one of the more successful business people, uh, indigenous business people here in, in Canada. And uh, I'm one of the people who comes from a, a generation, uh, a couple of generations of struggle. You know, actually with my younger family, about three generations have been in the struggle of uh, justice for indigenous people and uh, I think it's good uh, from the point of view of having Ron and I together simply because some people they always get critical of uh, issues uh, that they don't take in the economic kind of component I think when you have a person like Ron uh, that he, he's the one that can really represent that especially in among indigenous people because they can't really say he doesn't have a business perspective, you know. Did you pair yourself up to be this odd couple, or did you? Did somebody else kind of say, "Hey, this collaboration would be really interesting"? No, it's mostly because of uh, my ongoing work with with Ron. Uh, like Ron uh, was uh, elected chief way back in '99, and so was I elected chief. He was a chief of West Bank, and I was a chief of uh, Nascon. He actually went out logging off reserve before uh, we did well we actually followed him he was out logging uh, on so-called provincial crown land without a permit and uh, we said well we should do the same and so we wound up doing the same and i was also the head of the interior alliance and so he wanted our support which he got uh, and we just continued to, to work together even uh, despite the fact that we're no longer elected chiefs of our community and uh, we feel we have generally the same indigenous point of view of the struggle, you know. He's very moved by the poverty our people experience, uh, the powerlessness, and he, he wants to address that. I do too, you know, and so we, we work together.
What do you think the overarching theme or the messages of this book, if somebody wanted to pick it up, what would you say, this is a book about blank? I think it, it, it's about colonization. It's about dispossession, dependency, and oppression. I think uh, indigenous people have experienced it. My life in the book is uh, everything from going to residential school and and experiencing that you can't get more colonial than that and just the struggle that I've lived and our family has lived uh, for two generations it shows uh, that uh, we need to stop that and you know I, I, I say indigenous Indian reserves are 0.2 percent of all the land in Canada Canada can't justify that even domestically that that's the kind of uh, place that indigenous people should be thrust and expect that, that they're going to be uh, not dissatisfied and unhappy you know so that's why we struggle to defend our land protect our land is because uh, that's the next step for us that's uh, part of our road to decolonizing ourselves what do you see coming out of this next generation as far as title aboriginal rights and title and fighting for that well, I think for one thing, I think we, we need to really correct that notion of colonization uh, of, uh, of the colonial doctrines of discovery. We need to establish here in British Columbia that underlying title is Aboriginal title, you know. There's so many groups, like uh, I go to non-native groups, they start off with recognizing Indigenous people own the land. It has to be more more substantive than just doing that at the opening of a meeting. It has to actually translate into actually decision making that uh, regarding access and benefits to the land. You know, they have indigenous people have to participate in that. You know, and it shouldn't just be the federal provincial bureaucracies making all those decisions. I think that's going to be good for Canadians, though. That that step. I, I, I think one of the real uh, stumbling blocks for the Harper uh, strategy is that they do need to have Indigenous people agree to their strategy. You know, that Ron was mentioned, the $620 billion investment that they're, they're looking for in British Columbia. They know, they know they need Indigenous people to agree because the Supreme Court of Canada has recognized Aboriginal title and in Haida case, it recognized that if you got a strong strength to claim for Aboriginal title, then you also uh, have the responsibility, the government has a responsibility to, to uh, have a duty to consult and accommodate on issues. And uh, that's what's the, which is the stumbling block uh, of government. It, it causes what they call in the, in the mainstream media, economic uncertainty in the province and uh, that's going to put a lot of pressure on indigenous leaders and put a lot of pressure on industry and a lot of pressure on government to come up with some kind of rechanging the decision making process so indigenous people can participate. Right now they're trying to I think uh, buy off a lot of indigenous people based on um, jobs um, you know, business opportunities and resource revenue sharing. But I actually speak against those as being the full motivation for making uh, decisions simply because uh, those things should be a, for a given in any development that you do get jobs, you do get business opportunities, and you get uh, resource revenue sharing. You shouldn't be trading off your Aboriginal rights for those things, you know. And your Aboriginal rights is underlying title. It's still, it should go towards jurisdiction in terms of decision of whether or not we even want to do the development as opposed to the other things. We, we don't trade them off as a, as a quid quo pro uh, between the two different uh, elements. So, And uh, that's why I support young activists who are taking action on the land because they're going to jurisdiction. They're going to, I have this uh, proprietary interest title and I don't want you to mess with it. And that's it. And that, uh, that's the end of it, you know. 
And if there's going to be any development, then Indigenous people have to be included in the decision-making process about developing from the day of conceiving it right through to the end of exploiting it. Right now, they don't do that. Mines take over 20 years, and Native people aren't asked to consult and accommodate until the last 20th year. <laughs> They're not even involved in the one to two thing. And that's when they actually identify tailing ponds and stuff like that, and that's when they should bring people in. And, and Indigenous people say, no, you can't build one here. That's it, or pipelines or whatever have you. So the thing is that there is a lot of uh, um, development that, and growth on the part of indigenous, indigenous people too in terms of how do you put your foot down? What are the mechanisms to stop the system? You know, that is being done. During this discussion, not really, not really touching on the subject of indigenous law and kind of indigenous law perspectives of the land. I know you're talking about the UN and a lot of these declarations that are international, mm -hmm. but when it comes down to self-determination, indigenous law is kind of the basis for all of us together. So can you expand a little bit why maybe um, that's still not being talked about, sort of traditional law in the same context as business? I think uh, in, uh, indigenous law is is basically um, really uh, a whole new valuation of um, the land. It's where the air, the animals, the moose and the deer and squirrels, all of these things, the fish, salmon, and trout, uh, the, the land itself, the and all have equal value and equal say in what uh, humankind can do. I said indigenous people basically uh, do not really believe that man can dominate the world. We actually believe that uh, if you try that, something's going to come back and hurt you. And we actually see a part of that uh, is climate change. You know, uh, when you basically, your main connection to the land is profit. That means you want to convert trees into money. Uh, you want to create, uh, mit uh, convert minerals into money. You want to convert water into money. Like most of the legislation in the federal provincial government is based on how can you t convert uh, things into money. You know, it, it isn't for conservation of the salmon, the Fisheries Act. It's for how do you, how do you give licenses to fishermen, you know, to exploit the fish, and then you wind up with the loss of all the cod in the Atlantic Ocean. I remember when I was a kid, I watched in the National Film Board uh, these old black and white films. When they seen the cod, they say it'll never disappear. It'll always be a source of mankind for food. Now it's disappeared, and even now the salmon are going to go the same way. Uh, it you can't do that. It just is not going to work. It's going to come back on our, our great grandchildren. What's happening here, and Native people say that, that, and you know that's come one of the reasons Naomi Klein has written the foreword to the book is because we actually have a close uh, understanding that those two things work together. And if, even if you read, this changes everything. She actually goes through a whole. Uh, recital of all the different indigenous struggles that are actually at the forefront of uh, changing this uh, people how people approach weather you know uh, and uh, mother nature you know and how they're connected so no those are the bigger values of indigenous law that I'm talking about and uh, that's the kind of stuff that 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 are part of the book and in like what is the follow-up you know is to draw that connection between title Aboriginal title and climate change, uh, especially here in BC and Alberta, like where you're talking tar sands, pipelines, and all the nonsense that Harper's talking about, you know, so definitely. When you're talking about sort of not critiquing people like Sean Atlio or Ova, Ova and Mergerty, sort of because they need to sort of look after their own pensions or their money when they get older. I don't see a lot of women chiefs kind of going out and going into the oil and gas industry. <laughs> Is there any reason why? Maybe they pick other ways, or there's some people who, who find alternative <laughs> ways to kind of survive, like well, yourself. Well, I think I think I think um, much of the struggle for for self determination 
decolonizing, protecting Mother Earth is done by women, to tell you the truth, in the indigenous community. They're, and they really have a, a deep sense of commitment uh, uh, towards it, you know. And, um, you know, we, uh, I really appreciate that, you know. Uh, men do get involved, there's no and ifs and buts about it, but I, I, a lot of times uh, money really becomes a decisive factor about, you know, buying uh, a nice truck or doing different things like that becomes a more influential. And uh, I don't support it necessarily, uh, but uh, I don't really condemn people in the process. We're too small a community. Like, we're one million people. You can't start scrapping it out with each other <laughs> at that size, you know. <laughs> we're like a billion, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, what would you like to see happen in the next decade as far as the modern treaty process goes? Well, I think that treaty process, you just have to scrap it. There's, uh, there, because one of the things is it's based upon the fact that the crown has underlying title to the land. I think what has to happen is that Aboriginal title has to be looked at as the basic underlying title of, of British Columbia and of Canada. And that goes to the very, uh, what you call the very t territorial integrity of this country. Because the government has to realize in order to get uh, legit legitimacy, for Canada itself, they need to have Indigenous people generally agree that Canada is all right to exist on our land and they need to recognize its underlying title. The, the BC treaty process and the, the, the process that Ed John has doesn't recognize that. They recognize that the Crown has underlying title and Indigenous people are actually claiming land from the government, which is, you know, just totally absurd. That's how absurd colonization is, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Yeah.